not long ago, I asked you, Tom, what opinion, what view do you regret having held? And you replied that for more than a decade, more than a decade, you had been a serious Marxist. Yes. Explain that. Well, as that decade began, I was in, uh, living in, in poverty. How old? 19 years old. 19. So you're, in high, uh, you're starting college at that stage? Oh, or? good heavens, no. No, all right. I mean, I, I was out there working in unskilled jobs and trying to make ends meet, living in a rooming house. Up in Har you're living in, in Harlem? In Harlem. Right. Uh, and uh, I, I, I'd heard about Marx, but I finally someplace found that old uh, secondhand set of encyclopedias for $1.19 which I bought, and there was, was a, an article on Karl Marx, and it seemed to me that he explained these situations so well that... Uh, and the situation was what? That you the, the, took the train from Harlem down to the lower well, end of Manhattan? No, I would, no, the other way around, coming home from work, I would sometimes take the bus, and it would go right up Fifth Avenue past all these glitzy places, and across 57th Street where all the fancy uh, stores were, and Carnegie Hall and the rest of it. And then finally, uh, it was, I got near home, it would kind of turn off this uh, viaduct uh, into 135th Street, and there was that sudden change uh, in the whole scene at that point. And the question was, why was that? And the problem was uh, two, two problems. One was that no one else had, had given any explanation. There was no competing explanation that sounded plausible. In your life so far? Yes, right. yes. Uh, and the other was that uh, no one had cautioned me that it takes an awful lot more knowledge before you can make these kinds of sweeping judgments in any case. Uh, but fortunately, I'd been uh, taught earlier to, to respect facts and so on. And so even during my years as a Marxist, I would read things by people who weren't Marxist. I would read facts and so forth. But you, you, I have heard you say many times that you got a good education in the New York City public schools yes. in Harlem. Yes. So they did. They taught you to think. They yes. may not have taught you Adam Smith and yes. the defense of free markets, but they taught you to think. Yes. All right. Now, but keep continue the story if you would. You're a Marxist at the age of 19, taking the bus home right. from the southern third of Manhattan Island right. all the way up to Harlem. You remain a Marxist at the University of Chicago under the instruction of... Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman. Yes. How did that... If, if Milton couldn't crack you, you were a tough nut. <laughs> well, uh, uh, but, but, but one summer working for the government as an economist was enough to uh, uh, show me that the government was really not the answer. That the, government, that the level of understanding uh, uh, among the people, and I, and I was in a, in a program for interns where we saw the top officials of the Labor Department and so forth, and, and you, I realized these guys are not going to save us. They, <laughs> in other words, they had no, they were not the priestly caste no. that you might have been led to expect. They were ordinary chumps bashing their way through life as best they could like anybody else. Yes. I see. All right. And so, but intellectually, all right, you spend a summer working for the federal government, and that cures you of Marxism. Yes. But intellectually, when do you pick up the thread of free markets? Oh, I guess, well, well, well I, I had always... You, then I, you thought back to what Milton that's had said. That's right. It's, it's, not, it's not, not, not just Milton, but, but Hayek and the rest of them. Okay. Because I had read all those people while I was still a Marxist. A couple of... Uh, you have a, uh, an essay in here entitled Marx the Man. Oh, yeah. Quote, Marx's angry apocalyptic visions existed before he discovered capitalism as the focus of such visions. Yes. Explain that. Well, if you, you can, the, the poems he wrote in his uh, teen years, uh, one of them in particular I remember went to, to this effect that, uh, then will I wa walk godlike and triumphant through the ruins of the world. So he has these... Uh, apocalyptic visions early on before he's ever even thought about capitalism. And what the subtext as I take it of your it's entitled Marx not the Marx the political philosopher not Marx the economist but Marx the man. Yes. And what you're the, what I felt reading that essay is you're in effect it's like the scene in the Wizard of Oz where they pull back the curtain. Yes, that's right. The great and powerful Oz turns out to be an ordinary, cranky human being. Yes. And what you're saying is Marx is in, he's fascinating in some, highly intelligent, but in some cases, in some ways, kind of a nut. Yes. Just a man. Yes. All right. Another quotation from that essay. The members of the Communist League, we're talking now about the mid-19th century, Marx and Engels form, or they participate in the Communist League. The members of the Communist League 
were overwhelmingly intellectuals and professionals. It had the same kind of social composition that would in later years characterize many radical groups in which the youthful offspring of privilege called themselves the proletariat. Marxism is the conceit of rich kids with fancy educations. Yes, you, you see that uh, in the, what is this thing called, uh, the Occupying Wall Street group. Uh, all these middle class uh, uh, accents and so on. I mean, how many working class people can afford to take a month off to sit around in parks uh, and carry on and, and have all their uh, electronic equipment with them and all the rest of it? I mean, come sleeping on. Sleeping in sleeping bags with the first rate down feathers. Oh, right, yes. Right. So, but at what stage was there a moment when you said, wait a moment, these putative Marxists and leftists and uh, liberals, to use the term the way it's used in this country, as a leftist, they have, no cons they have no knowledge of nor concern for what life is like up on 130th Street. That's right. There was That's a moment, right. was there a moment or an incident when that just struck you? Or was that kind of a progressive realization? It was, it was a sort of progressive re re realization. All right. Ronald Reagan, the Thomas Sowell, I like ju juxtapositions here from Karl Marx to Ronald Reagan, okay. but you do it yourself. One old-fashioned way to judge a president is by results. A more popular way is by how well he fits the preconception of the intelligentsia or the media. By the first test, Ronald Reagan was the most successful president of the United States in the 20th century. By the second test, he was a complete failure. Yes. The f Marxists are rich kids with fancy educations. You've got the intelligentsia misreading Ronald Reagan. And you've got Tom Sowell from a very early age to the present, when he remains a fellow at Stanford, at the Hoover Institution at Stanford, making his career in academia all the same. How is it that you're able to swim against the current? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't be quite so truthful. This is television. We need to... Oh, I, I, I guess uh, partly luck. Uh, but but uh, but uh, I know I don't know. It's um, there are there are places. I mean, there are pl well, like the Hoover Institution. No, it's no great uh, handicap to have the views that I have here. Uh, and there are a few other places here and there. 